Welcome to Marine Tech Talk, a podcast about how Teledyne Marine's innovative technologies are enabling scientific discoveries and commercial tasks in the world's oceans and waterways. In this summer series of podcasts, we introduce the winners of our Teledyne Marine Academic Grant for 2020. This grant offers universities and institutions the opportunity to use several of our flagship products free of charge for up to a six-month period to support their research programs. In this episode, we meet Tim Noyes, a PhD candidate at the University of Salford in Manchester, England, and a research specialist at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences in Bermuda. Tim's research focuses on determining spatial and temporal trends of mesophotic reef fish biodiversity. Using the awarded Sentinel V100 ADCP from RD Instruments and the Benthos R500 Acoustic Release System, Tim will be working to quantify the hydrodynamic variability within the mesophotic coral ecosystems and adjacent shallow water reefs. Now, here's our guest, Tim Noyes, with the host of Marine Tech Talk, Melissa Ross. Tim, I know you're a PhD candidate at the University of Salford in the UK, um, and you're also uh, a research specialist at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences in Bermuda. Can you tell me a little bit uh, about what you're working on at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences and the focus of your PhD? Yes. So um, at the moment, I'm interested in mesophotic reefs. And these are reef systems that are slightly deeper than probably people are normally used to seeing. Uh, sort of the they generally start around the 30 meters down to about 150 meters, depending on light availability. And I'm very interested in the fish communities that are found there, and you know, sort of why they're there, and how they change over the course of a year, and um, and then that kind of ties in with. In the case of Bermuda, having a, an invasive species, which is the lionfish, and so through work, sort of working at BIOS, and then also building into my PhD, um, I've been looking at monitoring the changes and tracking the changes of this uh, fish biodiversity um, using environmental DNA metabarcoding and also beta cameras, um, and then seeing how different management approaches to remove lionfish, what the potential responses might be from the biodiversity that we see there. Before we go any further, congratulations. So the reason that we have you on the show today is uh, you were a winner, a recent winner of Telenai Marine's Academic Grant Award. How did you hear about the grant and what were you awarded? So I, I read the Sea Technology magazine, so I get updates from that. Um, I like to kind of see what sort of you know, equipment and sensors, et cetera, are available to us. Um, and I'm particularly interested in sort of autonomy of these types of things. And I happened to see the uh, the advertisement for the Teledyne Academic Award. I was lucky enough to meet the criteria applied and, and was very fortunate to be given not one, but two awards. Um, so I was uh, being given the use of the Centennial V100 ADCP and then coupled with that, I've also got one of the Benthos um, R500 release it set, so, which is fantastic. I thought it was interesting. Uh, you had sent me some background information on the research that you're uh, working on. The thing that caught my attention out of that reading was the evaluation of environmental DNA, which I thought was really intriguing, that you're actually looking at uh basically DNA left behind by various species, whether it be metabolic waste, skin cells, or other genetic material. Are you comparing the DNA from that um, environmental uh, DNA to known fish samples? Is that how you're determining what fish have been in the area? Yes. I mean, so the the context is that, I mean, the environmental DNA is a non-extractive method. So as you said, we're collecting this genetic material from the water, and from that we're then extracting, and, and in our case, we're using fish, the Helios fish-specific primers, 
So we're trying to identify sort of which genetic sequences we see. Those sequences then, like anything else, have to be compared to a reference. And so we're using either publicly available databases such as GenBank to compare. Um, and then as a, a separate project for the PhD, we're also in the process of generating a local genetic reference database. So my colleague and I, Dr. Leo blanco Bercial, um, we've been collecting fish samples, and from that, we're collecting tissue. We're taking photographs of the actual individuals that we've collected. Um, they're being sent away for sequencing, and then once we've got clean sequences, the uh, sequences, the individuals, and the pictures, etc., and all of the metadata about those the collections are then being donated to the uh, Bermuda Museum, Natural History Museum here, then they become publicly available for anybody who comes and does work in Bermuda. We want to be able to, in the event that there's any sort of changes in either the family or the um, you know, sort of the designation of which families or so on they're designated to, then the individual is there for an actual taxonomist to come along and say, okay, we can confirm this was the individual that the genetic sequence has come from, and they hopefully then have a much fuller picture of is there any questions regarding the sequences, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can you tell me what you're planning or how you plan to apply or how do you plan to use the products that you were awarded in your research? Yes. So um, one of the question marks well, um, sort of during these projects has been whilst we've got a, a much better understanding of the fish biodiversity there, um, through the cameras we can see sort of in imagery of the benthos, um, and we are collecting, obviously, as I said, the environmental DNA. Um, what we really don't have a great deal of understanding about is the, the hydrology, the actual water movement within the system. And so we want to kind of look at why fishes are there, then we want to see how productive the reef system is. We want to sort of determine the flow from open ocean across these mesophotic reefs and then into our shallow reefs and vice versa, so we can have a better understanding of one, you know, sort of nutrient availability of what well, are there potential upwellings, um, and then in the case of say temperature regimes, we want to determine, you know, are the systems stable or is there sort of an influence or a tidal influence, or that we have um, internal waves that come into the system, um, and we also want to look at the actual potential sort of I suppose, buffer area of where the environmental DNA has come from and, and maybe going to. So the studies have shown that the eDNA in marine systems potentially sort of persist for detectable levels for about 48 hours. So if we have an understanding of the speed of the water and direction of the water, then we can, you know, sort of using spatial mapping, we can say, okay, we've got signals from this site, then within the last 48 hours, we can say approximately this is the likely sort of area that this DNA may have come from. And it gives us sort of a much um, better idea of how sort of the shallow and the deeper reef systems kind of link. It would also give us, um, you know, a potential pathway for sort of larval input or outflow, etc. as well. So all in all, it's it kind of helps tie everything together. I mean, as a, I'm more of a biologist, ecologist, and, and then at the institution we have a lot of sort of uh, oceanographers and uh, physical oceanographers, and it's sort of a good way to actually begin to tie these things together and actually say, okay, we want a holistic view of the whole system, not just the ecology or biology and not just the sort of biogeochemistry. So what are, uh, if you were to sort of list them out, what are the overall goals for your research project? Uh, the immediate goal would be um, to quantify this, the speed and the direction and movement of the water at these sites. Um, I have temperature records from the locations, and purely looking at the temperature data, there appears to be a great influence or greater influence some of the sites um, based on our semi diurnal tie. And so I want to see if that's the case. Um, there is, and then I also want to see whether we have any influence of internal waves, uh, kind of those 
moving to you know sort of looking at coral bleaching and things and the effects of sort of ocean warming um how often do we get the sort of impulses of colder more nutrient rich water into these systems and the ADPPs will hopefully give us uh, an idea of that um and then <clears throat> also again you know sort of trying to actually ascertain the potential source of the DNA you know how how far could it have traveled from to get to the site that we've been studying and how far potentially will it move from there based on those sort of 48-hour uh, detection windows. So all of that data together um, when you're looking at the eDNA, the currents, the hydrodynamics of, of the area, does that give you some overall understanding of the health of the reef in general? <laughs> I suppose there's lots of different ways that you can define help um it would so coupled with some other measurements that have been taken based on carbonate chemistry we're we're also looking at the sort of the overall um community calcification and production rate so that would give us so using those measurements we're then beginning to understand how how much these reef systems are calcifying versus um actually going into dissolution. And then we're also seeing whether the systems are primarily relying on being sort of autotrophic, so they're getting sourced through the symbiotic algae, the zooxanthellae, or whether they're actually more heterotrophic, so the, the corals, et cetera, are, are actively feeding. Um, so it's, that there gives us an, an indication of the, the source of the energy into the system. Um, and then the... For the the water movements will help determine sort of how exactly these where these sources actually are coming from. It's not not necessarily a measure of health, but it it kind of gives us much more information about the system itself. I mean, as I said, you're you're tying in the sort of the the physiochemical aspect as well as the biology and, and trying to look at those correlations between. Them. When you and I were chatting uh, just before. Uh... We started the show here. Uh, we were having a conversation a bit about one of the species uh, that you're studying there, which are the lionfish. Um, how does that tie into your research? What is the issue with lionfish in the region? Lionfish, um, yeah, like the Caribbean, we have the lionfish, and it's an invasive species. So it's, it's not, it was introduced um, in Bermuda with not by people, but we believe it uh, potentially came from either the Caribbean or the eastern seaboard on the Gulf Stream. Um, <clears throat> and so it's it's not supposed to be in the system. Um, and so we have a case of where you now have a, a species that is, it's a piscivore, so it feeds on all of the native and endemic fishes that we have. Um, and it appears to have a kind of stronghold in these mesophotic reefs. And as I said, these are sort of ran, started around about 30 meters, so they're just out to spot. This is the very beginning of recreational diving limits. So for Bermuda, we have a, um, a culling program whereby people can volunteer and they can go out and they can recreationally remove flying fish. But in this instance, they're sort of it's too deep, really, for your, your normal divers. You need to be a technical specialist diver. So, um, Myself and colleagues here at BIOS, uh, Dr. Gretchen Goodbody Gringley and Dr. Leonardo um, Blanco Brasiel, we got a, two separate awards from the European Union um, looking at different management ways to remove lionfish in these deeper reefs. And that's kind of uh, the first was using in situ culling with technical divers, and then the second was using an experimental trap designed by NOAA. Um, and through those projects, that's how the sort of the monitoring of the fish biodiversity came into it, and how how could we evaluate the success of the different removal methods on one reducing the number of lionfish in at the study site, and then two could we actually detect a, a response by the rest of the fish there? Uh, that sort of how kind of all these other facets of the project have built into it, kind of understand better uh, the management practices for this invasive species. 
So how has winning the grant uh, and specifically the Sentinel V and the um, Benthos R500 equipment in the deck box, how have they impacted your research? Would it have been possible for you to do this research without those pieces of equipment? No, I mean, I've, I haven't got the access to, uh, to the ADCP without this grant. So the hydrological information we have is from sort of a, a very, very rough coastal current model. Um, there are a couple of ships that do have ADCP on them. Uh, so they're ship-mounted ADCPs that sort of transit across these areas, but it's not there primary sort of area, their primary function, I mean, it's very quick snapshot. So having having won these awards, it means I can specifically target the site that we have all this other data that we've built up over an 18-month period. So it, it really gives sort of the ability to then kind of tie everything together. Um, and as, as the ADCPs are, are out, the plan will be then to collect some additional EDNA and some additional water samples. So again, we can actually have timestamps at the same time the ADCPs are deployed, as well as retrospectively applying that to the, the previous data set. What's your current project um, timelines, and where are you going to be sampling from? Hopefully the ADCPs will be out towards the end of the month, if not beginning of July, and then the deployments will all be finished come sort of the end of the year. Obviously, we're in a slightly changed situation in globally at the moment, so it's been slightly challenging. Yeah. Um, but the plan would be to have the ADC deployed at the three study locations for sort of approximately six to eight weeks at a time. Um, and then hopefully that'll give one enough, it should give enough information uh, to understand the semi diurnal tides. We might also then be able to look at the effects of um, meter scale eddies. And if we're really lucky, um, we might get the odd uh, hurricane or two. I mean, we're, <clears throat> it's both to be potentially an active season for the Caribbean. And so uh, from a scientific point of view, it would be amazing to actually see what does happen when you get one of these you know, sort of big um, episodic events come by. Do you have any theories about what kind of data you're likely to see or what that data outcome is going to be from the research? Again, this is based sort of purely on the temperature records that I have. I think that I will see there will be a stronger influence on the location that is sort of further to the south of the island from a tidal point of view because although the, the reef system is 60 meters or so deep, um, these mesophotic reefs are the closest to the island. Uh, some of, as you get my other two sites, there they range from sort of three three miles to about ten miles offshore, um, just because of the the way that the reef system has formed. Um, and so I expect to see a sort of a different level of influence in, from the tidal point of view. Other than that, um, based purely on days of being out sampling <clears throat> and where. We would be on uh, sort of a 30, 40 foot boat, and we would have winds that were coming from the northeast. Uh, sorry, yeah, northeast. And yet the boat was actually, winds which were about sort of 15 knots or so coming from the northeast, but yet the boat was flowing in the 180 degree direction. Then I anticipate seeing some kind of some strong sort of um, current down there. And also, um, based on some of the technical diver reports of the, their inability to actually swim against the currents even when they had scooters at the t assist to assist them. So it's, I'm kind of open. I mean, I know the tidal, there will be a tidal if implement that's going to be different. Um, but other than that, as I said, we really don't have a, a good understanding of these localized areas. Of, so it's, it's going to be great to get the data. I'm going to wish you the best of luck on uh, your deployment. I'm actually hoping that uh, after the end of the season and you've had an opportunity to um, analyze the data uh, that you've collected this year, that we can have you back on the show for a follow-up interview to find out how your research went. 
sounds great. I look forward to it. All right, great. Thank you again, and really appreciate your time today, Tim. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Marine Tech Talk podcast. You can find out more about Tim's research at BIOS on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by looking up BIOS Station. To follow Tim Noyce on Twitter, look for at Field Noyce, and on Instagram, find him at Underwater Noyce. If you have any questions or comments about this show, you can email host Melissa Rossi at Marine Tech Talk at Teledyne.com. If you like this podcast, please make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're hearing this show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time.